So we just sang the. We just sang that. Um, I love it too. Uh, is he worthy? And uh, and so that was the. That was the song that William. You'll not be able to read that anyway. It's absolutely. Uh, unreadable. So William, talk us about talk us about this song. Talk us about what it means to you. Um, all of all of those things. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> this song is. This was impacted me personally for a long, long time, and it was. It was really around the time of change in our family, so we were going through a bit of a change in the last possibly three years or so, two or three years, and it was just something that was re repeating on me all the time. I just couldn't get it out of my head. I'm talking, not talking about like a week or a day or a month. It was just going on and on and on, and it was really stirring something in my heart every time I was singing it. Um, so I, I just looked behind it then and, and, and to, to just see where... You know, what, what, what was the, like, Neil spoke about, you know, the teaching and the theology behind it. And I, and I, I just maybe haven't got the, the ability maybe to go into the depth of that. But, you know, it, it speaks of, of John, really, the writer of, of the Revelation. Revelation is in the New Testament, for those who need to know that, right at the end of the New Testament. And um, John came to a point where the... the Chapter is it chapter five? I think chapter five starts with, with uh, a scroll being written, and it's quite mysterious. There is something hidden from, from all of us that's in that scroll. It's a book written, and there is something in it about the future that God has maybe put there, and, and and then John is is troubled. He's really concerned. He's he just doesn't know what's going to happen, and he doesn't know if there is anyone fit or worthy or able to open that book and find what's in it, is anyone able for it, any, anyone qualified for it? And, um, and in, in that almost point of despair in John's journey, someone comes and puts his hand on his shoulder and just say, says, weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the book and its seven seals. Um, and I just find that really affecting. I, I, I feel that sometimes I need that wake up call in my life for someone to come and say, you know, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah is able to open that book, is able to resolve all your problems. If you're finding, trying to find a solution, an economic or a political solution for our lives, I think what we need to look for is the Jesus solution for our problems. Um, and then immediately afterwards, it says then that between the throne and the four living creatures and all of that, you can go and read it. I saw a lamb standing as slain. And then the lamb comes and opens the book. And, and that's, there's a lot of songs around the lion and the lamb. And that's where it comes from, I think. Um, and I just find that really affecting. And it wasn't, it wasn't really the... The teaching that drew me to it, it was just the, the, the direction, the, the, you know, leading my heart into worship for that person who's called Jesus, you know, making my heart bow down to him, the one who's, who has every right, the one who is very worthy by who he is because he's God, so he's worthy to open the book anyway, but in this section it, it shows that He's worthy as well. He earned it because of his sacrificial love, because what he's done for us. He earned the right to come and open the book and, and unfold or, or open up what our journey might entail here, what our future looks like. Um, and I just found great comfort in singing that over and over again in the times of uncertainty when I didn't know which way is going to go. We, we did some things. Hopefully most of them were okay, but maybe some of them weren't 100%. Or, but just that gave me comfort, that song singing it on and on and on, that, you know, he is, he is there. You know, he is there and he's, uh, you know, there is a new creation, there's a kingdom that we belong to that, uh, that, that shall never be shaken, you know. And that kingdom is worked out here and now mm -hmm. in church and in divine grace and in, in Holy Spirit being present. So we don't need to worry about a certain government going and another new one coming because there is no political solution but there is this Jesus solution for us yeah, you know, Very I don't good. Know, is that... yeah that's really good uh, so I was struck with him by I didn't necessarily intend to 
like asking follow up questions. But so the the theology of it is the, is one of the things that impacted you. But it's also it's also the song is impacted you because of where you're yeah. where you're at. Yeah. And so Warren Wearsby talked about um, like there's something about music that gets that touches the mind and the heart at the same time, uh, and like something that that touches the the emotions. And can become a powerful tool in the in the hands of the spirit, or a powerful tool in the spirit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there's a question there, but just suppose I'm just like it's something that's touched you. I think because you're because you're a thinker and you love the word. This is like something that's impacted you your head. Yeah. But the song and the music is something that's caught your heart. Totally. And that is something, that, and I think that's why we're going to talk about this and give space for this because. With that, when something grabs your heart uh, and your mind, it, I think it really can become a powerful tool in the hands of the spirit. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the, so. And, and um, like even scripture speaks about the, um, the fruit of, of lips confessing his name. That's through worship, you know, through musical singing and worship to God. I think, I think that singing is, is really part of the inward, inside joy that you really, no one can take away from us. You know, you can take any, anything from me, from me, you can't take my joy, you can't take from me my singing. And it, it just, there's something about it that really stirs the insides where no one else can go. Only Hil Holy Spirit can go where, where that song was. So I, I'm actually really thankful about the time we had this morning because I felt, I felt for me it was really special. It is very special because it just stirs something like you say, it's not exactly the theology is actually, in this case, when I looked into the words, it took me to the scripture and I found the scripture. It was the song that stirred something and I didn't know yeah. why it was happening. So I love what you say. Good. Okay. Thank you. Super. Give William a round of applause. I am. Um, and so again, I, I know that everybody is bound to have one of these songs. And so if you're not going to tell me it, I'm going to come and ask you. Uh, I'm not going to make you come up here if you don't want to, but even if it's just a song that you want the team to sing, that would that you maybe want to share your share a testimony of how it has been at such a pivotal point in your life, whether it's just been something that's caught your mind, the theology of it, or something that's caught your heart, like the the melody and the emotion of it. We would, uh, I think, it's really really important that we that we do this. Um, I one of the songs I was really I was almost really sad. That Judith doesn't love this song as much as I do, um, but I've all, I've just always loved to sing it. And uh, and there's probably several songs, probably several songs, even mo like some of the new songs we've sang over the last couple of years. I do love um, a few of the older songs. I absolutely love. Um, but one of the ones that I always find myself coming back to, like I'm such a creature of habit. So if you were to go onto my YouTube and you would probably see that I've probably played about six songs my whole life on repeat. Uh, and one of them songs is Cornerstone. Um, Christ alone, Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he's Lord of all. And so I, I don't want to spend loads of time doing this, uh, like feeling like I have to unpack loads of this. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 20, uh, applies this idea of the Cornerstone to himself for the first time. Um, and so it's a, I don't want to go into that, it's the parable of the tenants, and uh, that's worth getting into f on its own as a standalone. But Jesus looked directly at these people who were, who were rejecting him, who were refusing to acknowledge the, the truth of who he was. And Jesus looked directly at them and said, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this was first applied to King David uh, in Psalm 118. That, and it was almost the idea of King David was this little shepherd boy. They had to go looking for him because they thought he was so insignificant. But the one that they thought was so insignificant that they could just dismiss and disregard actually became the, the cornerstone. It was applied to King David. Now Jesus was applying it to himself. The one that seemingly was insignificant, the one that everybody was willing to reject and turn away from, he was now a planet to himself. The one that you're trying to throw away, that you're one that you're trying to ignore, has become the, the the cornerstone. Or as Paul says in 
Ephesians talking about Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Um, and so I feel like a bit of a fraud here because like, who am I to stand up here and give any sort of instruction about arc, architecture? And I couldn't get the word right there, never mind talking about it. Um, but th- there's probably some things that I do know. I do know that the building, the building can never be more solid. A building can never be more solid than the foundation that it is built on. But what, have, what has struck me over the last few days is that in ancient Palestine, uh, the houses didn't, they weren't, they didn't dig down deep as usually they didn't dig down deep in order to lay the foundation. I know that's what, what happens now, but in ancient Palestine that was not the case. The foundation was laid at the ground level. The foundation was laid at the first level. And so the most, almost the most important job in ancient Palestine was to go and look for the biggest, the strongest uh, rock that you could possibly find. And that became the cornerstone. So as you built this house, as you built up this building, all of the pressure was put on the cornerstone. Everything, all of the weight of the house was built and lent into uh, the cornerstone. It all leaned towards this foundational stone. And that is, the, that is as far as my architectural conversation is going to go. Um, but I suppose what the... What did you tell me this morning, Jesus? What building has the most stories? What building has the most stories, everybody? A library. It's good, isn't it? I like that. What, um, and so it's like I'm not, go- I'm not going to take long. You've, you've bored with me enough, I think. Uh, what kind of stone is Jesus in your life? And I think that's what, every time I sing this, uh, like I want to say every time, maybe there's time, not always, but honestly there's something that gri- grips my head and my heart when we sing this song. Because it feels like it, it, I love the melody, I love to sing it, I love the worship to it, but I'm also provoked by it because I, I have to ask myself the question, what kind of stone is, is Jesus in your life? Is, is he the cornerstone? Is he, bearing, is he bearing all the weight of your life? Are you casting all upon him? Are you leaning all of what you have, all of what you're carrying upon the foundational stone? Is he the foundation stone? Is Jesus the cornerstone? I think that's a really provoking question to ask. And as you, as you reflect during this week in your devotional time, in your quiet time, as you, as you sit in the evening quietly before you go to bed, I'd love you to be willing to ask yourself that question. Because I know, that, I know in this, the story of Jesus that it was, it was pretty brutal how he was rejected. And maybe for some, most of us in the room, I'm sure for all of us, like we're not, we're not reje- we're, we wouldn't say that we are rejecting, we're throwing away. But I think sometimes if I feel like it doesn't fit, we, we do. It feels like the, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone doesn't suit, we shelve it. We shelve him. We, if it doesn't fit, it could look like rejection. If it doesn't suit, we can shelve it. And the truth is, for everybody in this room, no matter who you are, look around each one of you and look in the eye and say that you're all building something. Every one of us, in the figurative type of way, is carrying around a chain around our neck saying we're under construction. We are all under construction because we are all building something. We're all building something. So based whatever, well, what the choices you make this week, the actions that you take this week, you're building something. And so what provokes me around this song, what provokes me around what was the theology of it is that, um, is that we're, we're asking what, what, what are we building? And maybe as important on what foundation are we laying it? I can't cover everything this morning, but a few things that came to mind as I, as I, was, as I was getting ready this morning that, uh, Maybe some of us are building a house of pride. We maybe like, wouldn't like to admit it, but maybe deep down we know. We're building a house of pride and maybe on the, on the foundation of um, accomplishments. 
Or maybe we're building a house of security on the foundation of religion or the foundation of performance. Or we're building, we're building a house of success on the foundation of wealth. There may be other areas I could cover, but we're all building something. We're all building it on a foundation that we are laying. The truth is that the foundation is for the whole house. It's not just for one room. And I can be this is where I can be guilty of. I can be so guilty of like compartmentalizing different parts of my life. Like Jesus, you like this is I give you all of this part. But finances or whatever, I'm gonna let me let me take care of that myself. The foundation is for the whole house. It's not just for one room. Another thing I would want to say is, I just try to gather some thoughts around this, is that we build, build the house that he is calling you to build. Again, one of the things that I can be so guilty of is, is comparing my house to everybody else's house. Build the house that he wants you to build. Don't go around comparing houses. And, and the, tr- the reality is that I don't have to tell you this because you all know it, that the, the, the storms are inevitable. But if we're really conscious, if we're really intentional and purposeful and prayerful about what we are building and about what foundation we are laying it on, that through the storm, we're going to sing that right now, through the storm, it w- we'll stand. Through the storm, he is Lord of all. You'll not be, you'll not, it'll still affect you. It'll still, you'll still not be able to avoid them. You'll not be immune to them. But as you build your house on the foundation of Jesus, when the storm comes, you'll stand. And he, he, he'll know and he'll testify that he is Lord of all. And the metaphors then get mixed in this song because what I, what I love, the thing that probably grips me and, and, and William has sent us to, towards the end and this song begins to send us towards the end, our great hope that at the end we will stand before the throne and we'll stand faultless. Dressed in the righteousness of Jesus, we'll stand faultless before the throne. And there's some part of me, even what Neville was saying this morning, like we, get, we, we, we know in part we get a glimpse of this. I could like I can't fully get my head around how stunning that is, how to fully articulate what it means that, that at the end is because of how we've built and how the foundation that we've laid that we're dressed in the righteousness of Jesus and faultless, faultless we stand before him. Paul talks about that in Philippians. Faultless we will stand before him. And so there's so many reasons why I love this song. And you guys are going to come and, and sing it now because it speaks of hope. Our hope is built on nothing less. It speaks of his unchanging grace. It speaks of our position before him even right now. Faultless. It's how he sees us because of what Jesus has done. Because of what we've already acknowledged as we've taken communion together. We stand faultless before him. And so when he comes, when he comes, we'll stand faultless before him. Um, so the guy's going to come and we'll sing this and worship with us together and then we're, we're done but Father I thank you for thank you for what William has shared thank you for what we've sang this morning thank you for the power and the gift of song thank you for that, what it, that how it can be such a tool in the hands of the spirit when, you, when, when something about the song and the words and the heart behind it uh, just capture our hearts and our minds moves our emotion moves our thoughts, captivates us, God, and I pray that you would, uh, you would do that um, when we gather together, but you'd also do it in our, in our quiet times when we're on our own. Um, God, there'd be something that you would give us a song. God, even maybe for those that don't have a song that comes to mind, even this week, God, would you give them a song that would just capture and captivate and cause them to, to, to worship in a way that they never thought was possible. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for how you love us. Thank you for how you see us this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.